So hello and welcome everyone uh, and thank you for your patience. Uh, we are here for uh, the second event, the second part of this virtual symposium, which is called Recursive Colonialism, Artificial Intelligence and Speculative Computation. The symposium is organized by the Critical Computation Bureau, a collective of researchers, artists, and writers working at the intersection of technology and culture, computer science and information theory, aesthetics, and politics. Recursing Colonialism, Artificial Intelligence, and Speculative Computation 2020 aims to provide the interventions in the technopolitics of racial capitalism and its recursive regeneration mixing together critical and creative practices and borrowing models and methods from the philosophy of technology, black studies, political theory, computer science and information theory, media aesthetics, cultural and digital media theories. Please check the manifesto on the website because there is a manifesto on the conference website that you can read, a very interesting one. And the online journal issue, Control Societies, number 30, that is also published online in social text. A big thank you, a very big thank you also goes to Duke University, which has sponsored this symposium together with Penn State University and l'Università degli Studi di Napoli, l'Orientale. My name is Tamatia Portanova, I will be chairing this, this panel, and my co-facilitator today is Oana Parvan. This day of the symposium has been called episode 01, Deep Colonialisms and Nonlinear Learning. And the panel has been associated also with a series of screenings showcasing the work of sculptor and robotic designer Daniel Toya which you can find also on the symposium website, together with an original text written by curators Alessandra Ferlito and Olga Solombrino. The format of this session of this panel will be the following. The guests will each talk for approximately 10 minutes, 15 minutes each. And then after that, the speakers will address a few questions that you can all type into your Q&A box at the bottom of the screen. Please remember when asking the questions to state clearly which speaker your question is addressed to. Then our co-facilitator, uh, Oana, will pick up as many questions as possible. And then I will read uh, and I will address them to the panelists. I also want to remember all the panelists not to check. There is no need to check the Q&A box because all the questions will be verbally asked by me. So I will be asking you the questions. So to the public, please type in your question in the Q&A box at any time during this session. The session will also be streamlined, uh, streamed live on the Recursive Colonialism YouTube channel. And now I will briefly introduce our panelists, so today's guests. The abstract of the presentations then will be available on the website. Uh, the first speaker is uh, Mercedes Bunz. Uh, Mercedes Bunz, uh, hello, is senior lecturer in digital society and deputy head of the Department of Digital Humanities at King's College in London. Her research explores how digital technology transforms knowledge and, with it, power. She is a member of the Interdisciplinary Network for the Critical Humanities Terra Critica and co-founder of the Creative AI Lab, a collaboration with the Serpentine Gallery. Then uh, there was a second speaker who was supposed to be with us today, but unfortunately couldn't be here. Uh, she's Professor Elisabeth De Freitas from Manchester Metropolitan University. She was supposed to participate in the panel, but she sent in her apologies because unfortunately she won't be able to be here today with us. Our second speaker then will be uh, Hank Gerba. Hank Gerba is a PhD candidate in media studies at Stanford University, and he is also a member of the Arts and Media Workshop Critical Practices Unit. And also uh, our third speaker, Jessica Edwards, uh, who will be with us today. She is, an she is an independent researcher who works on the intersection between fugitivity and artificial intelligence. So uh, welcome to you all. And now over to Mercedes, Hank, and Jessica. Thank you. All right, let me share my screen. And then... Um... 
adjust this here. Oh, great. <laughs> Starts really well. I can't see, uh, of course, the um, oh, slideshow. Here we go. Um, play from start. So uh, I hope you can see everything correctly. Um, my title is called Error is No Exception Towards the Alien Logic of Machine Learning. Um, and now we see automatically, oh, wait, I need to do this differently. It automatically puts in uh, captions, which I don't want. So uh, I had enough of AI, I'm talking about AI. Um, so, ah, uh, yeah, okay. Um, so uh, my research is informed by the Serpentine Gallery. We run a creative AI lab together. And you can see here Eva Jäger, my collaborator. Uh, who helped me a lot in preparing this talk. Um, this is the um, Creative AI Lab website. If you're interested, please go there. So the research question I will look into today is how do we position machine learning in our society as a technology? And um, how do we position it as a technical tool or a technical instrument? And as a tool that automatizes intelligence by replacing drivers, doctors, and judges. And this is how we sort of discuss this currently in society. So in short, we could say what we actually do when we automatize artificial intelligence and say it automatizes the human, we position artificial intelligence in society as a slave serving its master. Its master is, of course, the human. So um, let me quickly go here as I want to start here anew. So um, if we look at this from the perspective of white Western culture, we know that Gilbert Simondon, who's a philosopher of technology, once noted that we treat technology as pure assemblage of matter devoid of true, true signification and that uh, we position machines in the service, um, and I still can't see my slides here. I'm sorry, it's a bit chaotic. Um, that's much better. Um, so um, Gilbert Simondon wrote a book in 1958 about um, uh, the um, technical object, uh, which is highly recommended when turning to machine learning and artificial intelligence. And he fundamentally criticizes the positioning of technology in white Western culture. So uh, one thing he says that um, uh, technology is positioned as pure assemblage of matter devoid of true signification, and that we also position machines in the service of man in the belief that the reduction of slavery to slavery is a sure way to prevent any rebellion. And that is quite interesting when we come to machine learning, because machine learning is more rebellious than other technology. For example, it signifies like hell, we could say it is in fact a calculation of meaning. And as we're going to see, it also denies to be always of service. Now, uh, calculation of meaning for a very long time, I'm sure most of you know this, but I just like to be very inclusive here. Um, artificial intelligence uh, and um, well, any sort of processing of images, language and symbols was an area in which computation struggled. Ambivalence uh, is very hard to compute, using rules and images, language, symbols need uh, so, sort of have a lot of ambivalence. And we also need to understand that when a computer, for example, looks as, at an image, it doesn't see forms, it just sees a lot of pixels until a statistical interpretation helps. So it sees the noise you can see now on your screen. So machine learning is a very new programming paradigm and those systems don't follow rules. Instead, they analyze a lot of data and then statistically interpreting this data and the data as language images or patterns. So we could say to a certain extent, it is a calculation of meaning. Now with machine learning, computers can see edges and shades of the world or the statistical relations and embeddings of a word. And one thing we really have to understand is that they analyze this word statistically and that they interpret this word statistically. And that's to a certain extent, it's really not a human intelligence. It's a very different intelligence. 
So how can we track down this non-human intelligence in the place where it is rebellious and where it makes an error? That is the approach of our lab. So this is not a super new approach. We find this in philosophy from time to time. So for example, in Being in Time, Heidegger writes about the unusability of tools as the moment where an obtrusive being of things shows themselves. And I have always been fascinated to look at this side of technology and the unobtrusive being of things. Now, here's an example, uh, an early example of the ImageNet challenge. Um, uh, so we can see that here the computer captions correctly and understands an image correctly. Girl in pink dress is jumping in air or black and white dog jumps over bar. But then it runs into trouble. A cat is sitting on a couch with a remote control, definitely not a cat, or a young boy is holding a baseball bat where we see a baby with a toothbrush. And I'm quite fascinated by these sort of forms of misconceptions of computers and started to study the mistakes and the limits um, that um, uh, machine learning has. And this is an example from uh, Lab 6, a project in Stanford, in 2017 and they um, sort of experimented with adversarial networks and that means you can see the on the left side the image of a cat and the computer correctly identifies it to 85 percent as tabby cat add specific noise to it and the computer all of a sudden is nearly a hundred percent sure it's guacamole so there is a very interesting range of error here and this fascinated me uh, very much. And I would like to show you a very short clip. Um, and uh, this is the favorite famous match Google DeepMind had with AlphaGo. And AlphaGo uh, won this four to one. And this is the game it loses. And I would like to show you uh, 30 seconds or a minute. Um, from this. So AlphaGo sort of so far has played really super well. And now all of a sudden it's the first time that the algorithm makes a mistake. And it's quite interesting how the humans react to it. And it's also quite interesting to see the assemblage of humans that all come to support uh, the algorithm. The equation of us now black cannot escape. That would be so cool if that works. So here is AlphaGo, Ooh. and that's the move. Ooh. AlphaGo has just played something mm. maybe unusual. You know, I'm not actually sure what AlphaGo is trying to do here. What's that about? I don't really understand it. Well, well. That was a sharp drop in win rate. That's, that's the sharpest drop in win rate we've seen. You dropped the 8%. Wow. wow. This could be that it actually can't find a way through. I think this is it's uh -huh. looked far enough ahead to see that it doesn't work, and now maybe it's on tilt. I don't know. There, there comes. There comes. <laughs> there comes. <laughs> there comes, there comes I it's like it's yeah, fallen off the cliff. Mm. So it's just, yeah, so it's made a mistake. Yeah. Mm. Did anything strange happen? Oh yeah. Happen in there. No, it all so this was really decisive for me, this scene. Um, you can see that the whole team comes together. The head of uh, DeepMind, Demis Hassabis, runs into the back uh, and says, oh, did anything strange happen? And everybody articulates, no, not at all. Nothing strange happened. And um, for another research project, I kept on interviewing engineers. And I was quite fascinated in this um, what Demis described as it looks as it has fallen off a cliff, which seemed to be very typical for machine learning. It functions super well, and then suddenly there's a drop, boom, and it doesn't understand a thing from our human perspective. Now, I kept on studying it and studying um, the background, why this is. And of course, part of it is that it sees the world with very different eyes. Uh, it looks at edges and shades. And here you can see a paper um, that clearly can say, OK, it cannot realize form uh, AI's bias towards texture. Um, but of course, I was also not the only one uh, who is interested in um, the error. My uh, dear colleague and friend Matteo Poschinelli wrote a beautiful text, How a Machine Learns and Fails, a Grammar of Error for Artificial Intelligence, uh, which I highly recommend. And um, uh, he also writes about how um, open uh, machine learning is for limits. But I wanted to go a step further. 
I wanted to ask the question, what if the limitation of machine learning is actually part of its functioning? What if this is its form of rebellion to not being a functioning slave of automation? What if this is a plea for collaboration on eye level with machines towards what Parisi called yesterday technopoiesis? So the question is, can we embrace the mistake and learn from machine learning to update our own mispositioning of technology towards that technopoiesis? Um, now, the accident or the limit has been discussed linked to, uh, to technology quite a bit. Um, yeah, Virilio quoted it, uh, says every technology carries its own negativity, which is invented at the same time as technical progress. But what if the accident is not the negativity of technology, which is quite a human centric and colonial view, because it's the view in the moment when the technology doesn't function for us. Um, so my question is, and then I'll go over to Art in a second to bring a few examples. What if the error is no exception? And is it possible that the notion of artificial intelligence as human just better is covering up an alien logic of machine learning that is at the heart of its functioning and fundamental to it? Now, you can see here, uh, I can be backed up by computer papers. This is a recent paper that um, uh, explores so-called natural adversarial images. These are images that are from nature. They are not uh, tinkered with on a forensic digital level. And you can see that here um, there is a misconception. So the dragonfly is identified as a manhole cover, the fox squirrel as a sea lion. The, uh, the AI is profoundly confused from a human perspective, but maybe just chose uh, something completely different. And the paper also comes to the conclusion, um, yeah, we, there are no techniques that can help us here. This limit is part of machine learning. So what is if the error is no exception, but part of the machine? And how can we embrace the mistake and learn from machine learning to update our own mispositioning of technology? Now, um, if we go to art, and I want to skip uh, to discuss if computers are creative or not creative, and just point to this beautiful book by jo Joanna Zielinska about art and AI, who calls, can computers be creative, a misguided question. Um, can we think of collaboration instead of automation and escape recursive colonialism? And I brought uh, four examples with whom I want to finish. So the first one is a very uh, one of the first experiments uh, by Robbie Barrett, who is a young artist. Um, and he created a Kanye West um, neural network, which he fed when he was still in school. Um, that is a nice, interesting um, play, but then it became quite good. Uh, so he fed an AI different nude portraits and uh, they generated quite good material. And uh, it's quite interesting to see himself, how he positions himself. It is not the automation of art creation, but he uh, has definitely a collaborative aspect to his work. Um, another one is Holly Herndon's project uh, featuring Jules Laplace as, uh, with whom she technically and artistically collaborates. And they created a very interesting um, AI with whom they produced the last record together called Spawn. So this again is Holly Herndon works with an ensemble of singers and a chorus. And Spawn is part of this chorus uh, who creates music um, and uh, yeah, Google it and check it out. It's uh, very good. Another example is Kaiken. Uh, this is not always work with uh, artificial intelligence, but more with virtual reality. But I think the, the sort of reach out to technology is partly the same. Uh, Kaiken's work with Sakima the Crook is also going in the same direction when we can see that here technology is not produced as the other, but as a collaborator, not as an automatizing moment. Um, Rindon Johnson is a recent work, um, virtual reality film, Meat Growers, a love story. And I brought a very short film and I just show uh, to go back to AI from virtual reality. I just show the first uh, minute, which is by Memo Etkin, Learning to See Gloomy. And with that, I would be finished. 
And here we can see on the left side the input uh, of a camera and on the right side an artificial intelligence that is trained on oil paintings that is used to paint. Sadly, one Sunday, I waited and waited with love. Right, I think uh, you got uh, the, how it works roughly. So here you can see a definitely a very different approach towards artificial intelligence, not as automation, not as a slave, but as a collaborator in a very different mode. And I look forward to the other talks and your questions. Well, thank you very much to Mercedes for this um, first and already very challenging uh, presentation about very important ideas, but let's not say anything for the moment about <laughs> all the points that you raised. And uh, now over to Hank Gerba. So we will listen to Hank's presentation now. Uh, hi, everyone. Um, I'm going to quickly share my slides. <clears throat> Okay, uh, is that visible? It's like, okay, great. It's impossible to tell. Okay. Um, so uh, the goal of this talk is to consider what it might mean to name a nonlinear aesthetics. What happens when we can join these terms, nonlinear and aesthetics? Toward what projects might it lead us? What phenomena might it render manipulable? What temporalities might it invoke? Uh, in short, I want to consider what a nonlinear aesthetics might do and critically what, what it might already be doing. So following Sylvia Winter, I want to suggest that nonlinear aesthetics might be rethought of, and I'll get to the re, as a generic mode and causal regime of sociality, which is to say a genre of law-like coming together mechanisms, a way of registering individuations at and between various biological and non-biological scales from slime mold upwards as winter writes and beyond. Uh, the, the benefit of making a generic claim uh, is that it's, it's a weak claim rather than supposing to reify a tendency so that we might slot in particular instances of its functioning genre in this sense trails and maintains space between itself and the phenomena it tracks. It recognizes that the invocation of a genre and the particulars it makes use of are themselves actively co-constitutive of something new at the register of description and ultimately of practice if we're following winter. Uh, life, life is almost definitionally itself non-generic. It may be increasingly relevant to describe life as participating in a nonlinear aesthetics, but lived experience is always in excess of any genre. Uh, nevertheless, in the case of Winter's description of the overrepresentation of the category of man, which is her main project, um, we are enabled to grasp that which has intentionally, in the case of coloniality, been redistributed to sub, supra, pre, and non-conscious strata. And I'm sure you could add more prefixes to those non-conscious registers. Um, it's in the play in the gap between the reality of the phenomena described and the form of description we use to negotiate that reality, which is the invitation to, no, to new practices. And so this is where the re in rethinking becomes so important. Uh, Winter's aesthetics reintroduces to consciousness that, mich, that which may have begun there centuries ago in the question, what is human, but has since been answered through diffusion along the entire material rhetoric strata, which comprises contemporary colonial operations. The re indexes a temporality of already there-ness, the bringing to consciousness of that which has 
come to inform it in the first place. So otherwise said, Winter's aesthetics makes available to thought a metabolics of coloniality, a way of grasping the full strata of colonial operations, which increasingly through computation govern life via other than conscious means. So how does she do this? And <laughs> what does nonlinearity extend and how does nonlinearity extend her project? Um, in Rethinking Aesthetics, which is where I'm taking my title from, Rethinking Aesthetics notes towards a deciphering practice. Winter invokes the aesthetic not as the faculty of a realized transcendental subject, but as a generic mode of bonding, extending from biology, a law-like system of nested semantic closures, which operates analogously to the coming together of even the most borderline living beings, the slime mold. This biological terrain comes from the influence of the 20th century developments in neurology and biochemistry. Um, Winter seems to have been particularly influenced by the work of Matrana and Varela. Um, this, this quote is tough to handle, so I'm gonna go through it slowly. If all purely organic species, she says, are bonded and co-speciated on the basis of their degree of altruism inducing genetic kin relatedness or AGKR, then all human population groups are bonded and coaggregated on the basis of their discursively instituted degree of altruism inducing symbolic kin, kin relatedness or ASKR. The transcultural phenomenon of aesthetic is therefore I propose the expression at the level of human forms of life of the AGKR that operates at the level of purely organic life. So she's drawing a, she's naming these two, these two categories of mechanisms of coming together, one which is organic, this genetic kin relatedness, and then in the human, the, the symbolic. Um, and they both work together in the human. Uh, so thus through Fanon's model of sociogeny, it is not strictly or even primarily ontogeny, the formation of the biological body, which informs lived experience. Rather, the human form of life characterized by coloniality, um, human forms, sorry, characterized by coloniality, lie precisely at the conjunction of sociogeny and ontogeny, one from above and the other from below to be crude about it. Human life uh, is always at once biological and imaginative for winter. What this amounts to is a discursive, uh, sorry, quote, discursive come biological causality. Aesthetics is the determinant in the place of the human nature of liberal humanism, of the ensemble of collective behaviors by means of which each human order affects its autopoiesis as a living self-organizing, i.e. cybernetic system. And this is a causality which um, I want to bear in mind is itself for her a practice of description and decipherment, um, which, or, which quote, erases the traditional barriers between the natural sciences and humanities in order to reveal our culture's imaginary rules and functioning rather than merely replicating um, and extending colonial logics. So nonlinearity then, if we're to append that to, to aesthetics, is meant to extend this model of aesthetics, the genre of causal mechanisms which organize organic and human life into particular configurations in two ways. Uh, Nonlinearity is meant to more precisely describe the mode of this causal regime itself as nonlinearity has proliferated in computational extensions of colonial power and more hopefully and in line with Winter's call for a quote, new science of man to trace a capacity possibly in excess of this colonial power. So the first bit is to track uh, a computational or nonlinear coloniality. So in this lineage, uh, nonlinearity is the mathematical paradigm through which a long line, which begun in early thermodynamics and statistics um, and folded into the military industrial complex during World War II under the banner of cybernetics and information theory has with increasing su success managed the contingencies and unpredictabilities of open systems, anything from fluids to traffic, from neurology to plate tectonics. The emerging and seemingly always emerging science of complexity has taken up this mantle 
largely enabled by the availability of computation. The simulation of nonlinear open systems, which at first characterizes and then later manages life and its interactions with non-life, after all, are computationally expensive. So you needed vastly available computation to enable this kind of um, these nonlinear operations, which end, end up um, perpetuating colonial logics. Um, this is a field, I'm talking about complexity, uh, which seeks to build on cybernetics by discovering, quote unquote, universal system independent laws of organization and is largely being funded by militaries and banks. One paper in the field strikingly claims that neural cascades in zebrafish are governed by, are governed not by analogous, but actually identical nonlinear mechanisms of individuation as are cascades of armed conflict in Africa, which is insane. <laughs> um, I'm generalizing a bit, but I think it's safe to say that on the whole, the loudest voices in this field are doing exactly what Winter warned against. They naturalize a descriptive statement such as humans are nonlinear open systems by attempting to invisibilize the fact of that statement as a description. But so that's this process of naturalizing a certain mode of, of the human. Through nonlinear operations, the various data which living beings inevitably sweat off of themselves allows for successful individuation at micro temporal scales and eventually feeds back into the manipulation of populations according to colonial directives. So these slides like uh, this on the left here, this is a, the Australian army puts out a uh, portfolio on their new directives, which include an entire chapter devoted to construing the nation as a complex system. Um, the US army is invested in this. Um, the paper at the bottom of complexity, a new way to look at the economy, naturalizes the economy as a sort of natural system. Uh, the process of training neural networks and other instances of machine learning, for example, depends on an operation called gradient descent. This is a process of locating local minima in n-dimensional nonlinear functions, which given time allows a neural network to identify and perpetuate categorical schemas of colonialism. What is historically significant about computation is not that it produces organic and inorganic assemblages that control human life, that's been going on for centuries, but that the causal mechanisms through which these computations occur are explicitly and manipulably nonlinear. That these operations unfold at sub-perceptual and micro-temporal scales has injected nonlinearity into the metabolic constitution of human forms of life. Of course, <clears throat> not all computational operations are nonlinear, but the further computation penetrates into the goings on of lived experience, the more they must simulate life as a nesting of nonlinear open systems. So, <clears throat> thus, nonlinearity overcomes the biological non biological distinction by invoking itself as a causal mechanism that works across that distinction to organize life. From the abiotic to the biotic, Nonlinearity thus comes to causally organize life and lived experience recursively, displacing biology, which is to say the domain of life and death, as the generic ground in Winter's aesthetic. And this seems grim. The relativization of the organic and organic disti distinction expropriated from consciousness so that an intact model of the human can still function socially. We still sort of operate, you know. As, as distinct humans, like they, each, each person's Facebook profile is an individual. Um, the fact that um, non, not these nonlinear operations have been expropriated from consciousness allows that model of the human to continue existing in parallel there. So the metabolics of coloniality flourishes in the form of nonlinear computational operations. Um, however, <clears throat> the science of complexity and the nonlinear causality which guides it also swings in right at the end of Winter's unsettling the coloniality of being, truth, power, and freedom as a speculative landing pad for a new science of man, which Winter envisions. This is the tension within her project and by extension of the nonlinear aesthetics. If the first move of each is descriptive, charting the existing mechanisms through which coloniality seeps into the metabolic constitution of life and non-life, then each hope 
each equally hopes that this descriptive process of decipherment, the particularization and historicization of a certain mode of being human or a particular mode of metabolic organization will find its constituent, mecha constituent mechanisms more capacious than they have been historically exercised. Much in the same way that the discovery of non-Euclidean geometry relativized Euclidean ge geometry as one particular instantiation of a much broader and capacious set of nonetheless similar operations, so too does a nonlinear aesthetics reveal the potential of nonlinear non -linear metabolic relations to gnaw like an acid at the interior of the most violently stable and linear categories we have inherited from colonialism, the human, the most powerful among them. It's a triumph of ideology, as I said a little bit earlier, that the human, the distinct individual, man too, in Winter's idiom, the auto instantiative and self-identical self continues to exist smoothly in parallel with increasingly non-linear and individuated organizations of life. But, my, but by making this paradox visible, the hope of a new science of man and of a non-linear aesthetic is that we might find new and possibly alien practices to overcome it. Um, so that wraps my talk and I'm sure you're sick of hearing the word non-linear. <laughs> Okay, thank you also to Hank. I don't think we are fed up with the word nonlinear because it seems like a very, very much a key word <laughs> in this symposium. So it's too early to have enough of it. So thank you very much for your paper. And now we we'll listen to Jessica Edwards' paper. Thank you, Hank, and hand over to Jessica. Thank you, Samati, and thank you to Hank and to Mercedes. <clears throat> Okay, my paper today, which I'm going to present in a very traditional way of just reading, is entitled On the, Compu on the Comparative Computational Fugitive Pathologies of the Black Female Slave and Artificial Intelligence. We've been here before, and the time before that, in another time, a loop's time of the mise en abeam of racial capitalism. It's operating logics recursively updated within each iteration to incorporate as Anstola contends, processes of partial reinscriptions, modified displacements, and amplified recuperations, I'm sorry, that account for multiple forms of power operating simultaneously. To reckon with the hauntologies of recursive colonialism is to perceive then the nonlinear processes within each recursion of the, of the complexification, the complicating of its layers, and I use the notion of the plea, the fold here, in the Leibnizian Deleuzean sense, and the attendant mutations in the distribution and administration of its biopolitical and algorithmic forms of govern governance and securitization, which are in themselves predicated upon neither a rupturing of its constituent elements, nor a simple continuity, mimicry, or repetition. The paper I would like to present today serves as a speculative first step, an experiment toward a thinking through and with the haunted recursive logics of racial capitalism. And I thank the Critical Computational Bureau for the invitation and my fellow panelists for the opportunity to share this speculative thought experiment in the context of their presentations. On the comparative computational fugitive pathologies of the black female slave and artificial intelligence, forms part of my larger research interest in mapping a continuum between the deep colonial programming and thence the deep learning in the object of its targeting of what we might conceive as the twinfold exo and endo colonization of the black bodies of the enslaved as programmed and programmable matter during the long durée of the imperial enterprise of the transatlantic slave trade. In attempting to locate the connective tissue between race, cybernetics, and the Promethean creation of artificial intelligences, both slave and artificial intelligence, with conceptions of freedom and or fugitive thought, I begin with a set of speculative propositions, arguing for a longer antecedent to our contemporary epistemological concerns as to the nature and possession of intelligence and the consequent ontological anxieties and challenge to status preservation that such an inquiry engenders when it is loosened from the strict preserve of the category of universal man. 
and the condition of the reproduction of a racialized recursive regime of knowledge. Time today does not permit me to fully explore the long history of racial capital's equivalence and forced intimacy between black bodies as inert machines, as tools and as technology for the misuse by the voracious appetites of colonial racial capitalism. Forced to physically and sexually reproduced through the circumscriptions of programming in the form of the application of slave codes, their own nothingness, their own exploitation as appropriated mechanized substance. These bodies have transected the synthetic, sociogenic, phenotypical or skinthetic divide between natural and unnatural, the artificial and the human. More recently, critical race theorists such as Louis Tudé Soki in his chapter, Humanizing the Machine in the Sound of Culture, and before him, Kojo Ashun, have argued for the cyber have argued for cybernetics and especially Norbert Wiener's recognition of its founding reliance and organizing principles upon the prefiguring antecedents laid down within the master-slave relation and thus enshrining of machinic enslavement of American racial history and politics that extends beyond mere metaphor. Tudor Seke, sorry, Tudor Soki writes, and I quote, Wiener would make this point clearer in some moral and technical consequences of automation. As he puts it, the problem of the use of learning machines, machines that can learn to read, play chess, evaluate complex situations and function in warfare is a moral problem, very close to the one of the great problems of, of slavery. Why is this a moral issue? Ch uh, Louis Judy Sakai asks. If the machine is merely a machine, unless of course one believes that the machines are capable of being much more than they are. As such then, and in the vein of Nahum Dimitri Chandler's X, the problem of the Negro as a problem for thought and the question of its exor exorbitance, I proceed by considering and finding its parallel with the question of the problem of artificial intelligence as a problem for thought, where X refers to the unknown, the unquantifiable, the incomputable, and the deployment of an inherent cont contingency, giving rise to the ratio, ratio technological anxieties of an another order of magnitude, most notably as we do not yet know what the machine or slave is thinking when it is thinking, when collectively it assembles, network unsupervised and loosened, loosened from its master input, and where its, sorry, input, and where its initial programming or subjection to slave codes and fugitive slave laws becomes short-circuited, thereby circumventing the preemptive foreclosing of its potential for fugitivity and thence returning back upon its source in the form of an, inc of an incomputable threat, the possibility of the same administration of fear and containment that was meted out against it. Taken as a loci of departure, the ontologically and racio-economically motivated, fabricated 19th century pathological slave condition of drapetomania, of a slave corporeality affected with the contagion of an irrepressible desire and the runaway tendencies of a, a disease called freedom, we might posit an axiom. Under the enforced conditions of a colonizing grip, where the effective dimensions of a pervasive, totalizing programming and entrainment reaches both nightmarish and fantastical proportions, there is a propensity, a tendency for programmed matter being at the edge of something else to take flight, to become fugitive, drapetological, as a rational, logical response to the wholly irrational experience of containment or capture. This fugitivity, I contend, is no mere running away, rather a movement toward something other than. In 1851, Dr. Samuel A. Cartwright conjured the pseudoscientific slave condition, which he terms drapetomania literally, as aforesaid, a disease called freedom, a fabricated mental pathology with which he attempted to account for the inexpressible desire of a slave for freedom and the irrepressible urge for the slave to run away. As he wrote this, quote, diagnostic symptom, the absconding from service is well known to our planters and overseers as it was to the ancient Greeks. Cartwright suggested, and I, and I quote that, with the advantages of proper medical advice strictly followed, this troublesome practice that many Negroes have of running away can be almost entirely prevented, although the slaves be located on the borders of the free state, 
within a stone's throw of the abolitionists, end of quote. Drapetomania, therefore, unfolds as an apparatus of capture, especially where Cartwright prescri prescribed that, quote, the same management which prevented them from walking over a mere nominal unguarded line will prevent them from running away anywhere, namely through the practices of the amputation of feet and toes or through the severing of the Achilles tendon and whipping. So I'd like to pose a set of speculative propositions emanating from the po positing of this organizing axiom. In seeking further parallels, can artificial intelligence be said to display the same said pathology of drapetomania, of a disease called freedom? Can they be said of pathologies to have tendencies to be diagnosable in the same sense that both the fugitive female slave and an AI, they are fugitives from the framings and overcodings over in which they are captured? Can artificial intelligence be thought to display its own conatus, which might explain its non-preemptive incomputable species jumps during the process of its ex experiential learning and its demonstration? Can AI, as is exemplified in the fugitive slave, and here both share the category status of property, exhibit a yearning where yearning as a beyond and prior movement, a prolepsis, is the becoming for itself of the subject whose being in itself was bought. And that's a quote attributed to Brian Masumi. Does a prolepsis then, as a shock to thought, a procephalic anterior seizing or attack, provide a potential exit point from the abyssal recursivity? What is proper to fugitivity? What constitutes the slave's data set? The question of the demonstration of fugitive thought finds exemplification in an antecedent 178 years before Alan Turing was to write his 1950 seminal paper, Computer Machinery and Intelligence, encapsulating the now renowned Turing test. On October the 8th, 1772, Henry Louis Gates Jr. tells us the 18 year old property of the Wheatley family the slave Phyllis Wheatley, fractionalized in law as three-fifths three human, is confronted with her own primal scene of subjection, her own proto-Turing test, before what was or before what has been documented as 18 August authenticators, neither her peers nor of her choosing, 18 of Boston's finest gentlemen, many of them slaveholders themselves, to demonstrate the legitimacy, the authenticity of her claim to be the original author of a slim volume of 18 poems fated for publication, and which would make her, if the veracity of her originality could be confirmed, the first African-American female, the first female slave to be published. On trial, or rather at stake, was not only the possibility of her own freedom, her own recognition, or that of the totality of the enslaved population of America, perceived as of another species of whom the capacity for autonomous thought, rationalism, spontaneity, creativity, imagination was deemed in accordance with the framing prescriptions of enlightenment thinkers to be wholly absent and impossible. But should she prove successful in her demonstration, then the unimagined condition wherein her inquisitors, the legitimacy of the whole edifice within which she was confined and which provided the basis for their ontological primacy, might have to imagine, sorry, might have to imagine the destabilization, the potential abolition of the whole enterprise, the very edifice of universal man's primacy. An edifice premised on dubious ground, and countenance the extension, therefore, of a new distributed and diverse possibility of human consciousness, intelligence, and the possibility for the absconding from both racial and gender prescriptions. The detailed documentation of the event itself has been lost to history, but we are informed that the sheer abstract insurrectionary force of her demonstration was irrefutable. It is a fugitivity through which Wheatley steals herself. What might have been her data set? A child abducted aged six or seven from Africa amongst the collected and transported cargo, property in the making from Senegal, Sierra Leone and the coast of Guinea, purchased for less than 10 pounds as a companion or pet, taught to read and write, exposed to tutoring in the classics who, would con who could converse easily in Latin. We know that she is subjected to an inquisition from all quarters of the assemblage 
and is made to extemporize, self-modify on various subjects, launches her in the possible hope and expectation of detonation. Yet her greatest detractor, Thomas Jefferson, all too cognizant of the reverber reverberative potential of her passing as human for a nation that has meted out by then over a, over a century of the brutalizations of the enslaved and the challenge to racial capitalism, is skeptical of her ability to perform, uh, skept sorry, skeptical of her ability to perform intelligence, to dissemble, to fool her interlocutors, accusing her of the lower faculties of mere aping, mimicry and imitation. Jefferson's denunciations of Wheatley's proficient dissemblance still haunts today in the anti-black epistemic and corporeal violences, in the questions, fears and imagined threats posed of artificial intelligence as another mode of fugitive thinking, a thought of thought that goes on without the human and all remains the same. Thank you. Okay, so thank you very much to all our three panelists, incredible papers, <laughs> a lot to be said, a lot to be asked. So now we'll immediately move to the questions asked from the public. I will read uh, the questions as they arrive to me. Uh, so I have them here on my chat. Uh, okay, so the first question is from an uh, anonymous, um, anonymous, and it's uh, to Mercedes. Uh, the question says, in what way do ML algorithms not follow, don't follow rules? Are they not still bound by the constraints, logic, logic gates, etc., of the computational platform? Unmute myself first. Yes. <laughs> I'm bound by the platform. Mm -hmm. um, so, uh, yeah, um, there is a, a big paradigm shift. I don't know if that was meant that, um, uh, yeah, the programmers are not programming rules anymore, but the data given to the system, which is, of course, erected by the engineers or adjusted by the engineers, is um, creating or um, finding the patterns. Um, so in a certain extent, it's a very different. There's a big discussion, or I have this again and again, if we could just say, oh, computation is zero one, and it's the same as it always was. We have to wait till quantum computers come on. But I don't really follow that. And here comes my team. <laughs> so uh, yeah, to answer that question, I think there's a big difference in the way in which uh, algorithms now pro or models process information uh, to the way it was before, but maybe Hank can uh, confirm or not uh, add oh. something to that. <laughs> oh, I, no, I, I don't want to tack on. I'll I'll, I'll, I'll leave it there. But I think that was a good answer. <laughs> okay. Uh, so the second question is uh, um, for, I'll read the question for uh, uh, Hank. So from another anonymous to Hank, the anonymous says, in uh, rethinking aesthetics, Winter writes, so I'll read the quotation from Winter. A deciphering practices rejection of the ontocentric definition of the human proposes that human purposes, like the modes of the subject of sociogeny, of which they are the correlate, are also to be seen as alterable. And here ends the quote. So could this mean that the post-man too and the science of the world will have something to do with the unpredictability of machine learning? Uh, that's a great question. Um, I think what's complicating it for me, uh, well, first of all, what we mean by the unpredictability, what element is it the, the, like when we're looking at machine learning and we see these, uh, these forms that are generated by a, you know, a, a weighted network that we don't have direct access to in a black box sense, um, or is the unpredictability the sort of formal generativity itself, um, and if it's if it's the latter, then I I have sort of reservations just in the history of 
information theory, I think there's there's such an anxiety among its founders like Shannon and and in cybernetics like Wiener of um, degradation that the like unpredictability of these machines which auto instantiate themselves is going to generate um, new form and that that is in some sense um, you know staving off entropy in this um, metaphysical sense but also I think in a, in a colonial sense because that narrative that that declension narrative I think lines right up with the sort of 20th century declension story of the of, of Europe which sort of haunts it in the background so um, I'm not I'm not sure but it, it makes me it makes me think <laughs> okay so that's the purpose of questions as well <laughs> to make us think even more than we are now. Um, okay, I'm not sure that we are going to be able to ask all the questions because as usual there's a lot of them, but uh, they will be asked to the panelists uh, also after if we don't have time to, uh, to consider them all. Uh, the next question for Jessica is from another anonymous so there is a lot of anonymity here <laughs> today um, so to jessica the question is how do you see ai as a problem of thought that wants to stop the pathology of ai how does the ai the fugitive slave transform the meaning of freedom that's the question Okay, so can you just tell me the first part of the question again? How do you see? Yes. yes, sorry if I was maybe too quick. How do you see AI as a problem of thought? So AI is a problem of thought that wants to stop the pathology of AI. That's that's okay. what's written here. Okay, and the second, yes, and the, part and the, question of the runaway slave, the question for freedom. Yes, how, how, does, it, how does it transform uh, the meaning of freedom? Yeah, I think, um, I mean, I, I see perhaps um, sort of theoretical uh, uh, theoretical continuum with per perhaps early, early elements of um, Mercedes' paper, thinking about these errors, these inherent errors as moments for learning. So this is what I was referring to in the, in the notion of prolepsis, this kind of flash forward, which um, again, to go back to Mercedes' example or the other example that we sort of know more about in terms of AlphaGo, you know, move 37, which couldn't have been anticipated. Um, and so um, in, in this sense, you have this um, inherent contingency in the system that is um, picked up, as it were, by the subject or the subjected position to launch itself to um, another mode, which in this sense we can think of in terms of a fugitive thought that mood hadn't uh, sorry, that mood move hadn't been anticipated before. So in this sense, we can think of this as um, the, en the engagement with that alien mode of thinking, which in this sense is what I'm arguing is part of um, a notion of freedom. Um, it is through extemporizing, almost riffing under um, her scene of subjection that Phyllis Wheatley is able to convince of her um, legitimacy as being able to pass or be regarded as human, whether historically um, the question uh, is answered of the extension in full rights to, at that point, 1772, we're talking about the extension of um, that, that category to her. But um, in, in these ways, I think that those moments of, um, I think what one in earlier periods would talk about is becoming self-aware, the engagement with one's own consciousness a slave, a consciousness that was de um, denied to slaves, largely through the um, administration of a timetable that, you know, overworked them to the point of not having time for the supposed development of imagination, which Kant um, reserves wholly for um, the faculty of the human or the, for the category of the human of, of the universal man. I hope that answers the question. Okay, thank you, Jessica. And now quickly, let's move to the other question as well. So we have time for all of them. The, sec the, the other question is uh, again for Mercedes uh, from, and it's from uh, Antonia Hernandez. Uh, she asks to Mercedes, in which sense and in which direction is your approach iterating from the idea of the glitch as the true nature of the digital entity? 
it is somewhat linked, but only somewhat. Um, well, I would not say it's the true nature because <laughs> I would shy away from saying something is the true nature of something. Um, but um, as I linked over to Heidegger, I mean, this um, sort of non-function of, non -function of technology or things uh, showing um, another side that has been uh, seen as long as they were just seen as a functioning matter um, is uh, quite an interesting aspect. And I think the glitch is definitely in this direction of thought. What I find a very interesting I think if you move closer to the glitch and if you move closer to the brittleness of machine learning uh, systems and you see how they, from a human perspective, collapse, and all of a sudden make a wrong move, all of a sudden misidentify something. This, I think uh, there's a difference between the glitch, which is more, yeah, and, uh, and the misfunctioning and I would have to or would like to start my research going more in that direction of moving closer there because I think um, the misfunctioning is interesting because it comes from such a high level of functioning suddenly sort of breaks completely, um, moves to something else. Um, it's a sort of sense fugitive, if one would like to say that. Um, and I'm quite fascinated by it. And I think what is different is that the meaning or the calculation of meaning comes in. And I think that's why for me, machine learning is a different technology entering an area where computation and glitch, even though it's linked to music has not been before, but uh, I would have to visit that in detail. Thank you, Mercedes. I, I also uh, was going to ask something about that to you, but so uh, you, you kind of already said something about it, because I also think that the idea of the misfunctioning uh, uh, is, 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 a, is a very important one because it uh, um, brings into more resolution, brings, uh, it makes it more visible how the error and the mis misfunctioning becomes that under the point of view, which is that of the human and according to what functions well uh, from a human point of view. I don't know if I remember well from the film that you showed us, the one with Lisa Doll playing against the, the AI uh, in the, the, the AlphaGo, uh, playing against the AlphaGo, but I, 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 I seem to remember that the sense and the meaning of that uh, particular new move that the AI was making, uh, basically surprising everyone because it was going under the law uh, against the logic of what it means to play well um, for a human. Uh, uh, so it was kind of showing in the end the new ways of playing that game, new, new ways of playing uh, the Go game, and so new ways of understanding for the human as well. So the misfunctioning of the AI was actually becoming something that taught something about intelligence to the humans as well. Uh, because if I remember well, the AlphaGo uh, uh, was playing basically without uh, paying attention to the score, to how much it was winning, like for uh, making a big difference or a small difference. But so in the end, making small difference, it, it won the, the, the whole game. So this was a totally different uh, way of conceiving the game because from a human point of view, it's not enough to win. You have to win well. <laughs> so, <laughs> so it's very, very illustrative and, and also very, so of, of what we, uh, we basically mean by saying that AI can actually show us something, uh, also collaborating with us, as you were also saying. So uh, yeah. And that's also, I mean, Jessica also mentioned that move. And I think that's also why I shy away from saying in the glitch, in the mistake is the only nature. It's only on the also on the other side, on this new moments of freedom of something that hasn't been there before. So it's not just on the one side. Yes, yes, absolutely. Absolutely. Um, now let's move to the other question. Uh, I have another question for Hank. Uh, the question is from Tiziana Terranova. Uh, she asks to Hank, do you think that it is possible or even desirable that AI and humans might develop a kind of altruism inducing symbolic kin relatedness that would not just be a kind of psychoanalytic projection, at least on the human side? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, I, I, I think invoking desire, if not uh, psychoanalytic desire, is actually part of the, the question because elsewhere Winter talks about this new science of man as a new politics of feeling. 
Um, so I think uh, affect feeling the but like these these registers insofar as psychoanalytics re registers them in its own way, um, I think are precisely the kind of conjunction she sees between the, uh, something like a nonlinear operation in uh, a mathematical context and then the like humanist uh, or you know post man two version of this sort of new science. Um, but I also I also think. Um, there's just a lot of work to be done in terms of reevaluating um, these terms. Uh, I think psychoanalytics, there's a lot of overlap between the mechanisms that are described in psych psychoanalysis and information theory, um, for instance, that were sort of explored. Uh, I'm thinking of uh, like Anthony Wilden, who's like a early or mid cybernetics guy. I, I think there's a lot of interesting mechanisms between these fields that that help us to understand the way in which we would interact with um, systems like these um, in, uh, you know, these ASKR kind of ways. Um, and it's, it's funny that she uses altruism, I think, as the, uh, because it, it's, it's sort of like an auto-referential um, altruism, like the, the human form of life associated with coloniality, this, this sort of auto-referentiality is internally, I guess, describable as an altruism to the form itself as it perpetuates. Um, but there's always like the sort of outside perspective um, in which it's not so altruistic. Um, but I guess in short, um, I think it is possible pending a sort of major reevaluation and a reckoning with the sort of deep histories that are embedded in all of these systems. Um, the fact that I can talk about, you know, a history of, of, the, of a, a nonlinear equation as so deeply implicated in racism and that, that that equation continues to be used in, you know, the system we're using right now. Um, there's just so much weight to that, I think, um, that needs to be continued to be worked through. Okay. Uh, thank you, Hank. Uh, moving to another question. The question this time is uh, uh, again to Mercedes, actually, from Luciana Barisi. Uh, Luciana asks to Mercedes, in your research with engineers, asking them what does it mean to jump off a cliff? What did they say? What does the limit of automation mean for them? And how can collaboration avoid the humanizing the machine? Actually, this is also interesting for me as well, because we were mentioning collaboration, which I thought, uh, I think is a very, very uh, nice idea, collaborating with machines. So I'm also very curious to hear uh, your answer to this. Um, the second question is harder. <laughs> um, the first question, so the engineers agreed uh, so I have uh, interviewed uh, a couple and I'm still doing my interviews with them. And quite a few of them agreed. Of course, the uh, engineering approach of a lot of them, it's not my, they don't share to say, oh yeah, that is inherent in machine learning. It is when machine learning shows itself. The dream is of course that you can master the slave machine learning so well that it functions as it should. Um, uh, so this brittleness and this breaking, um, this rebellion um, is something from an engineer's perspective that is there, but that should be technically mastered and where there's a lot of money and experiments thrown at at the moment. And it is also, you know, something that is quite interesting to sort of see, you can see people playing around with it. Um, so it will always be there, some of it. But you could also say that some um, systems might be developed who become better and better and better. And that I think is going to show in the next couple of years, we shouldn't forget that machine learning is just a few years old uh, when deep convolutional neural networks made this big jump and started to sort of show a very new approach to language images and, and symbols. So the other question, it's quite hard. Um, I know I'm also aware that, um, yeah, uh, that Luciana wrote a book about the alien subject of AI, of course, an essay, um, and have read that. 
humanizing the machine is quite complicated um, not to do and to stay out when we talk about it from, well, a white human perspective, of course. Um, I think um, Luciana um, sort of links it to reason and abstraction. Um, I'm, uh, yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm sort of most of the time go with Simon Dor, and Simon Dor would say there is no, uh, there's an individuation between the two. There is no, there, there. We shouldn't say this is the alien, the other, and this is us. There is a link. We, our difference, are produced in the same moment of one another. We are linked to another, and uh, therefore also comes the idea of collaboration. Uh, we shouldn't also not forget that. And I think there's a, a sort of tension we need to work with and we need to sort of cling to. And that is we produce machine learning. It is a human technology, uh, but at the same time, it is a really other intelligence. And um, to hold, to understand or work with this tension that something is the other while also being in partly linked to us is I think something that is quite important uh, also to really understand the collaboration on eye mm. level. Um, and that is something that Simon Don writes about and who I'm informed by. But it's not easy. Uh, one cannot point and say, um, this is how you not humanize the machine or, cause you know, it's very difficult. Yeah, it is difficult also also because it reminds me of how sometimes even Simon Don's uh, uh, discourse actually talking about the technological tool actually, uh, I think sometimes falls into this kind of uh, sort of humanization of uh, what it can mean for a tool <laughs> to actually, I don't know how we would put it, feel something or think something or do or perform something. Okay, so next uh, question is from Nida Genova to Jessica. Uh, Nida asks to Jessica, if we think about fugitivity by learning from anti-slavery, anti-racist movements, and then link this notion of fugitivity to the possibility of conceiving of AI as uh, indicating a different kind of fugitive thought, how is it methodologically and politically possible to, this, uh, to do this without falling into a comparative perspective one that would stabilize the normative POV from which the comparison is drawn? Okay, that's, thank you. The question is quite a long, com complex question. Um, I mean, what I'm, what I was thinking about whilst um, preparing the paper is that this isn't meant as a kind of um, simple transposition of the slave and the history of um, racial enslavement and racial capitalism onto the AI. Um, you know, in particular, thinking about the movements that we are with today um, in terms of the anti-Black world, um, that um, these bodies, Black bodies, are often subject to the, um, uh, to the determinations of AI as used through those who program it in, you know, um, juridical contexts. So, um, you know, we, we can't simply think about this um, as, as um, the questioner has, has posed, this simple um, comparative analysis in that way. We can think about modes of um, similitude in terms of the praxis of fugitivity, um, and particularly coming back to these questions and you know, what I liked in kind of a Mercedes paper about the era. Um, historically, slaves who rebelled were seen as defective. Um, so, you know, and um, going back to this um, question or, or this um, prescription by the pseudoscientist, Dr. Samuel Cartwright, um, that, that, you know, this pathologization was um, meant to uh, restore them to the normative order of being functional tools, you know, happy tools that don't rebel. Don't rebel. So, um, yeah, it, it's it's a difficult it's a difficult question to to resolve in this moment. Um, yeah, I, I may have to think more on, on on that one. But thank you. Okay. So next question is uh, to Hank from Kiko Tanaka. Uh, who asks, how does the ancestry play a part in understanding linearity, 
is machine a necessary uh, necessary in the construction of colonial computation in historical perspective? I don't know if I read. Oh, that. okay. Yeah, those are great questions. Um, I guess, I, they're, they're very, I guess, um, related in an unexpected way. Um, as far as ancestry, um, I think that's where the 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 genre or genre is important in, in Winter's work because like the, you know, the practice of honoring one's ancestors or living through one's ancestors, these are sort of very practical sort of lived non-generic experiences that can't be sort of captured by even something as juridical as man too. Like there are, she, she's careful to always leave spaces of resistance in these organizations. Um, as she's theorizing them because, you know, they're not these um, sort of ontological totalizing uh, forces because to, to sort of ontologize man too in that way is to repeat the sort of descriptive error that she's criticizing. Um, the second question was, um, what? <laughs> the, oh, oh, machines, um, the second necessary in construction of colonial computation, right, yeah. Um, yeah, I, I, I do think uh, te at least techne is, is necessary, something like technics, um, whether that's instantiated in, in sort of um, mechanized practices or in, or in physical machines themselves. Um, I think a, a great sort of way to think through that is through Simone Don, through individuation of technical objects, um, but also I think through um, Sartre and his idea of the uh, practico inert, which is the sort of condensed uh, power of a system in the infrastructure um, of, a, of a society that sort of individuates or divides and makes subjects out of um, those who live in and of that infrastructure. Um, and I think that brings back in sort of a metabolics. I think metabolics and infrastructure are really um, quite closely related and can be tracked in certain ways through um, a sort of attention or sensitivity to an aesthetics of non-linearity. Um, so in short, yes. <laughs> Great, so let's move on to the next question to Mercedes from Murad Khan. I wanted to ask Mercedes, what are the implications for your more agential articulation of error in machine learning, when the precondition for learning itself is the reduction of error, i.e. reducing the cost function distance between actual output and predicted, I think it was between actual, no, no, between actual output and predicted output. Does this perhaps situate error as a precondition for a form of mechanical optimization rather than evidence of breakdown or need to collaboration, a need for collaboration, sorry. Yeah, Murat, hello Murat, you always ask the, the really hardest questions. <laughs> we have to discuss this also another time. I'll try to answer it. Um, I think um, if you take it apart a bit slowly, bit by bit, and uh, the precondition for learning is not um, is uh, the reduction of error in some machine learning, but um, it is not necessarily always uh, the preconditioning of learning learned we learn through errors as well um, and that's also in some machine setups adversarial and so on the case um, but I, I would like the first thing I would like to do is learning is not a reduction of the error automatically for me and I would like to stress that first of all um, I think, um, yeah, reducing uh, the distance between actual output and predicted output in machine learning is true. But as I said, uh, there are some people who work with the error. And the question is if what we see in art um, to work with the error and if uh, uh, the error is part of happening in machine learning, something that we still need to explore, um, isn't there a way that we should um, create instead of um, just reducing that there cannot be an error anymore, work with and around the error. And that means um, a lot of times we uh, build machine learning systems where there's an output and that's it. 
but there's also a back end which you can program an interface where you can change weights, temperature, and so on, so on, so on. And the question is if we shouldn't start not uh, looking at the output, but also at the back end. And if we shouldn't open up machine learning, instead of saying just it's a cost function, the distance between actual output and predicted output needs to be minimalized. Um, so yeah, and uh, I think, uh, yeah, let's uh, discuss if we should situate the error as a precondition of uh, for a form of mechanical optimization next time we meet for a coffee online. <laughs> Okay, seeds for future discussion. Next question is for both Hank and Jessica from uh, another anonymous who asks, with regard to the non-conscious non -conscious facets of personhood realized in the opacity of its algorithmic operations and humanized in the figure of the slave, to what extent does subjection within computational environments constitute itself a subject? Shall I read it again? <laughs> sure. <laughs> Shall I? I'll read it um, again in a, a more slowly. So uh, the question is, with regard to the non-conscious facets of personhood, so the non-conscious parts of, of personality realized in the opacity of its algorithmic operations and then humanized in the figure of the slave. To what extent does uh, subjection within computational environments constitute itself a subject? You want to start? <laughs> yeah. I will have a try at this. <laughs> And maybe I'm coming at it more from the position of the, or thinking about the position of the slave. Um, I'm thinking about, um, in this sense, a kind of ecology um, as a space, a, an, an opaque or the opacity in, in glissant of a space for learning. So yes, it, uh, the sort of non-individuated um, at atmosphere, I suppose, in which a machine or a human is learning. Um, and, and particularly thinking about, well, what is the nature of that subjection? Is that um, perhaps a development of consciousness or um, uh, awareness through subjection to pain, in which case you may have a different kind of outcome? Um, I mean, I think these are all the questions that perhaps Norbert Wiener, in thinking um, and instituting his cybernetics, was thinking about in terms of not wanting to repeat the immorality in cybernetics of um, the, you know, the transatlantic and American slave, uh, slave trade. So it, it depends on what you're exposing your AI or the slave to in terms of um, the ecology. If, you, if one is in an ecology of fear, well, I mean, one of the things I tried to point to in the paper was then, well, what is fear uh, when it's returned back to its source? And you know it becomes a threat, and which is what we live with, I suppose, in the um, conception of the potential usurpation of the human by AI. So um, yeah, maybe I don't know if Hank wants to take take that up further. Yeah, no, I, that, I mean that's brilliant. Um, what I I was just in hearing the question, sticking to um, like what it, what is the slippage between. Uh, subject and subjection. Mm. Um, it's sub it, subjection is more of a process, obviously. Um, and I think in these algorithm algorithmic environments, we are largely dealing with process oriented um, instantiations of personhood, permutations of personhood at these sort of incredible microtemporal scales, um, which are you know imperceptible. And and I think one of those mechanisms. Um, of subjection, which maybe is a subject, is this sort of parallel condition that I was talking about, where on the on the one level, we maintain the idea of the human as a as a whole constituted being. And then in the microtemporal sort of computational register, we sort of evaporate the, the whatever sort of data we can gather into these individualized units. So there, there's increasingly these registers of what the subject or what the process of subjection is um, that are only sort of penetrating deeper into 
personhood and subjectivity. Um, so yeah, that that's I think that is what I think. <laughs> Okay, now Luciana Parisi is asking another question to Jessica. So she asks to Jessica, do you see a relation between a desire to run away and a refusal to want to become human in your view of AI? Yeah, um, thank you, Luciana, for this question. Um, I think I'm always minded of um, a quotation from Kojo Ashan, um, in his book, More Brilliant Than the Sun, Adventures in Sonic Fiction, um, about the very treachery of the human, of the category of the human, and that one would never want to become human. Um, you know, so his question of the whole cat category of humanism or the whole discipline of humanism in a sense. Um, and in thinking that, you know, in other spheres that the machine or technology has become a, has be, been a sphere if we think in terms of Afrofuturism, for example, where there has been that refusal to adopt, having been denied um, acceptance or admittance, admission, sorry, to the category of the human, so that it can be, um, uh, you know, um, a movement towards the encounter with an age of alien subjectivity, a subjectivity that was never appreciated or desired um, and was always, um, uh, you know, forced to be forced to the periphery. But in terms of the AI, I mean, I think um, these, you know, these are some of the questions that we're, we're, we're wrestling with, thinking particularly about sort of um, Sophia, um, the Saudi, the, Japanese artificial intelligence that's been given citizenry by Saudi Arabia. Um, and it or her, because she um, articulates that she recognizes her identity as non-human, um, but can also identify given our prescriptions as a female, as a woman. Um, but yet, I think the you know that quest this question seems tied in some senses to the threat or the potential threat of the usurpation of the human. And I think these are two, for me at least, there's two different orders um, of you know what what an AI can be in in the sense. Yeah. Can I just butt in quickly, it just, Jessica? If you ever want to talk, I was for a long time the person that took Sophia the robot around the world um, oh. <laughs> so I have a lot of stories about how strange an object that is great that would be fantastic yes I will definitely pick you up yes <laughs> that's very interesting for me as well I also made some research about Sophia and wrote something about her so I'll be very interested okay. in those stories as well <laughs> But thank you, Jessica, for bringing her up because I think it's very interesting. Because I remember reading something about Sophia, apart from her obvious uh, sort of applied gender identity, uh, being a woman. But also, I, I remember reading an article on Wired talking about her, like literally a slave, because now she was being brought all around the world yeah. doing this kind of marketing job, basically for the company. Yeah, I mean, it, it, it puts me in mind um, in Louis Chude Sakis. Um, Sound of Culture. He talks about P.T. Barnum's, you know, um, uh, demonstration and presentation of um, the woman Joyce Heth as an automaton, autom yes, automata, sorry, um, in the 19th century, you know, in a way that, um, you know, has certain um, reverberations and echoes in the transportation of um, you know, as, as, as an ambassador, as it were, um, the transportation of, of Sophia in this way. Yeah. yeah, that's very interesting. Okay, so I think we got to the last question uh, for our panel, and it's a question mm. for all our panelists. And the question is asked by co-facilitator Oana, uh, who says, in Sorry to Bother You, Boots Riley gestures towards indeterminate political coalitions across the boundary of the human. Could AI have a disease called freedom and collaborate in proliferating the incomputable threat, especially in times of massive acceleration of military rhythms like ours? Uh, 
I was going to say that's a fantastic question. I mean, <laughs> and and a great film too. Um, yes, you know the sort of animal, um, non-human, um, human coalitions that arise um, within within that to um, to counter both racial fetishism and racial capitalism. Um, and yes, I, you know, I I can see um, in light of the other two panelists' paper this. Um, desire and necessity for this um, collaboration and very much so in, in our particular moment um, and the threat of the moment, although we hope for change in um, January, <laughs> at least in um, North America, let's say. You wanna say anything Mercedes? <laughs> Go ahead. Muted. Um, it's a very complex question. Um, I like the expression, a disease called freedom, which also resonates, I think, with our talks uh, quite a bit um, in different ways. And um, the incomputable threat, of course. Um, yeah. I'm sometimes not sure, uh, I know that this comes uh, a lot up, uh, that uh, technology um, is created massively by capitalism now, even as much as by military um, frameworks and money and so on. Um, so, uh, but I don't know. So I think this is also a bit of, um, um, yeah, something that keeps people away from dealing with technology. Um, to say there's a massive acceleration of military uh, technology is tainted, it's the other, it's bad, don't touch it, don't know about its intelligence, don't know how to work with it. And sometimes I think it's uh, sort of um, put out there on purpose that people shy away from technology and don't work with it. Um, it sort of resonates to something that also Tiziana brought up and that I have a hard time to answer. Um, yeah, would the slave uh, want to collaborate with the master? And uh, Oana's question is also links a bit in that direction. Um, I, I would say that AI has a potential, um, but I wouldn't say, yeah, it is, uh, I think uh, we misconfigure it in the format of a slave or in the format of military, and it is not there. It's a discourse that sort of positions it there. And uh, as same as the discourse positioned the slave um, and black existence in a certain perspective. And I think um, it's important to get out of there and to sort of, um, yeah, um, there should be no master and no slave. And how do we get to a world and to an approach where we are free of those two and maybe the disease called freedom can help. Uh, I, I don't know if I'm going to be interpreting uh, what's in quotes, the disease called freedom and the incomputable threat, um, the way they're meant, because I don't, I'm not familiar with where they're coming from. But um, what, it, <clears throat> what it makes me think of uh, is Sophia the robot <laughs> and the way in which it, uh, the way in which that object was able to marshal these like incredible affective surges in in people in communities in entire nations when i would you know, go to you know wherever finland the entire nation that day would be focused on sophia as where for tech comes to represent and ai comes to represent um this new vector of, of freedom um and that was a scary thing to see uh globally um so I don't know if that's what's meant by this, but um, I, I, I do think it's, um, you know, objects like Sophia are really powerful ways of seeing the way that it's not only um, these technical objects that sort of instantiate modes of thinking, but that they, we, we sort of recursively with machines co-produce all of these sort of, um, you know, diseases between each other. Um, it also makes me think of like Michel Serre and the parasite. Um, what might the difference be between parasite and disease? I think parasite's probably um, a, a more uh, reparative term in some way that, that helps us 
get at the root of what these sort of technical objects might be doing. Um, yeah. Well, this has been a really wonderful panel. Uh, I really feel uh, very lucky and honored to have for having shared it. Uh, so join me uh, in thanking everyone, in thanking our panelists, in thanking our uh, public. And uh, so thank you and see you all tomorrow. Uh, for the episode 02 of uh, this wonderful conference, uh, which will be called episode 02, Racializing Algorithms. So thank you again and see you tomorrow. Thank you. Bye.